Well, welcome back to An Achievable Dream, where in this episode, we want to discuss a few of the tips, tricks, and some of the lessons learned when it comes to the supplies, equipment, the systems, storage, and maintenance relating to the exterior portions of a long-range expedition yacht. Unlike boats designed for coastal cruising, true long-range expedition boats are in a separate and distinct class all their own, which we described in more detail back in Episode 5. These boats need to be both capable and prepared for cruising long distances to remote locations of the world with the endurance to safely handle rough weather, to cross large bodies of water, and then to remain on scene for extended periods of time. By necessity, these boats must also be set up to perform much of their own maintenance on board and to carry ample supplies, tools, spare parts, and tenders for shore excursions, fishing, diving, piloting, and to conduct maintenance. So regardless if you hire a deckhand or, like most of us, choose to undertake these responsibilities yourself, the boat really won't care. The job description, duties, and responsibilities involved will remain the same. The deckhand's duties and responsibilities require a basic understanding of how to maintain the vessel, its machinery and exterior spaces, which will include inventory control, the safe storage, handling, and maintenance of tenders, bikes, kayaks, and deck equipment, along with the handling of supplies and their replenishment. It is also the deckhand's responsibility to perform the tedious tasks of washing the boat, polishing, inspecting, and making routine mechanical, electrical, plumbing, cosmetic repairs, and ensuring that all of these items are secured properly to prevent damage or accidents. So let's go through the different exterior areas of the boat, starting on the foredeck, and then we'll work our way aft to the boat deck, then down to the lower deck, and finish up on the top sides of the boat. The primary foredeck tips we can share, especially for any boat headed to the Mediterranean, is to have a total of four cleats, two port and two starboard, plus at least a single capstan electric warping winch. These winches are typically designed with their motors and gearboxes below the deck and a shaft penetration through the deck where the capstan drum is then mounted. The watertight seal or gland around the shaft needs to be inspected and lubricated at least once or twice per year to protect water from running down the shaft and into the gearbox. Here is an example of what the gearbox looks like when the seal fails or routine maintenance has been neglected. Furthermore, these winches are typically operated with a deck-mounted waterproof electric footswitch. The two common points of failure with these footswitches are caused either by water intrusion or more often their improper use by the operator. These winches typically draw between 60 and 120 amps, so failing to both deliberately and fully engage the switch creates an intermittent, weak or poor electrical contact, which will cause the electricity to arc from one contact to the other and can burn up the switch in just a few seconds. It's a good idea to carry at least one spare foot switch with you. In addition to having the correct sized anchor and ground tackle worked out, you will also need an effective and efficient system of washing down the anchor during the retrieval process. This saves time, conserves water, extends the life of your anchor gear, and prevents collateral damage by not ending up spraying mud, salt, and debris all over you, your hull, and the deck. It is best to have a well-designed and dedicated anchor washdown system which combines a low pressure, high volume saltwater washdown spigot to flush the anchor chain and cable before it hits the anchor roller, then a secondary high pressure, low volume freshwater washdown system to remove the salt and any remaining mud or debris as the cable and chain come over the roller and before it's over the foredeck. If set up correctly, most all the salt, mud, and debris will be removed before the ground tackle is on board. It took us 10 years before we figured this out, 
and it has made the anchor retrieval process more of a one-person operation. It's quicker, cleaner, and we use far less water. Your high-pressure anchor washdown system will also be indispensable for weekly, if not daily use in washing down the boat. It more than halves the time of you rinsing off the boat when you come into port. It is more efficient by using approximately 75% less water and is overall far more effective by concentrating the stream of water and thereby providing more cleaning power and a far better tool for salt removal. A full boat wash for us requires about 300 gallons of tank water versus 75 gallons when using the high pressure wash down system. Utilizing the same make and model of high pressure wash down motor and pump as installed in your water maker optimizes the use of your onboard systems and provides you with a working spare while adding versatility, functionality, and backup. Bottom line, a high pressure wash down system will improve overall efficiency in terms of cleaning both the boat and the anchor. You will achieve superior results, conserve water, save time, and it does away with the need for you to carry a spare pump or rebuild kit for your water maker. Having good foredeck illumination is both practical and an important safety item when handling dock lines, warping winches, and operating anchor equipment to ensure better visibility during nighttime or low light situations. You might also consider adding a small remote speaker for your VHF radio so you don't miss any important radio traffic when working out on the foredeck. Now let's move back to the boat deck. While on the subject of lighting, floodlights are an important safety feature if you have to work out on deck at night, especially if you are going to be operating any heavy equipment like your deck crane or davis. It is also a good idea to mount a floodlight out at the end of your crane to illuminate your tender while it is tied up alongside, or as landing lights for when the tender might be arriving or departing the boat after dark. Direct illumination of the tender also facilitates safe porting and disembarking after dark. Having a floodlight out at the end of your crane is also important for added safety if you are using the crane for nighttime operations like to launch or retrieve any items and certainly when docked in the Mediterranean to illuminate the stern boarding ramp. For added safety when operating in fog or reduced visibility, we often run with both our aft and forward facing floodlights switched on to improve our visibility to other vessels. While on the subject of safety, we want to emphasize the importance of reasonably aggressive non-skid for preventing accidents and injuries, particularly in areas where the risk is high, such as the radar arch, the mast, ladder rungs, and other critical deck areas. As mentioned in episode five, this is especially important if you are forced to service or inspect a piece of equipment while underway or at night. This same mindset should be applied for all your deck areas, walkways, stair treads, the passerelle, boarding stairs, and the swim step. In all areas where safety is concerned, you have to prioritize function over form, and aesthetics needs to take a back seat to ensuring a secure and slip resistant surface. If you are incorporating non-skid into the painted surfaces, we have been pleased with the results from using All Grips Polymer Non-Skid in a 50-50 mixture of fine and coarse beads. It is important to recognize that walking surfaces become twice as slippery when wet and three times as slippery when that water is then mixed with salt. Before moving off the topic of non-skid and safety, we want to also emphasize the importance that your ship's standing orders require the wearing of closed toe shoe coverings whenever out on deck. While some may perceive this as excessive, our primary responsibility as captain is to prevent accidents and to look out for the safety of our crew and our guests. We take this responsibility seriously and the wearing of closed toe shoes is just too simple and effective a way to minimize injuries when out on deck. It usually takes an accident before this rule is fully adopted, especially if the toe turns out to be yours. 
As discussed in more detail in Episode 5, the tender or tenders play a vital, versatile, and essential role in just about every aspect of life on board your yacht, except perhaps while it is actually underway on a passage. Tenders act as the primary means of transportation between the yacht and shore, serving as a water taxi to shuttle crew, guests, luggage, provisions, and supplies. They provide the necessary connectivity for accessing different locations and facilitating logistics. Tenders also enable a range of other functional activities, including exploring or scouting the surrounding areas, fishing, diving, and beach landings. They provide the means to engage in a host of water-based recreational activities and offshore adventures. In certain situations, tenders can serve additional operational roles. They can function as a pilot boat, assist in close quarter maneuvering, or providing support during docking or anchoring procedures. A stable tender will also be tasked as a work platform for a wide variety of exterior maintenance and repairs. It is critical to select the appropriate size, type, and features in your tender that align with the specific needs, activities, and age of your guests, plus the intended cruising location of the yacht. That said, you will need at least one of your tenders to be able to safely operate in a variety of weather conditions, including inclement weather, while staying dry and providing seating, storage, safety, protection from direct sun, rain, and cold weather. Your primary tender will need an array of electronics, typically like a chart plotter, certainly a depth indicator, a GPS, a VHF radio, running lights, possibly an AIS, or even a small radar. In addition to navigational electronics, you will also have engine and fuel gauges, a bilge pump, an anchor, and need a watertight compartment for stowing life jackets, a limited number of tools, spare parts, manuals, binoculars, a handheld searchlight, spare engine fluids, and a fire extinguisher. The tender will need secure handholds, a windshield, sufficient fuel capacity and or the ability to resupply with fuel, a swim or dive ladder, fenders, a telescoping boat pole, a lifting bridle, and possibly even a towing harness. You will also want to carefully consider your deck equipment, like the crane setup, the tender's cradles, and or its chocks, hold down hardware, providing additional fendering to protect both the tender and your yacht, and to have thought through the best way to manage boarding or disembarking the tenders in less than ideal conditions. The importance of this last point can't be overstated, especially when it comes to children, elderly guests, and pets. When it comes to a heavy tender, having good hold-down hardware is vital. During the early years on Oasis, we used a combination of turnbuckles and cargo straps to secure our big 3,400-pound tender, which was time-consuming, clumsy, and really inadequate. We finally found the right hardware to positively secure our tender in its cradle. We switched over to three of these Wishard adjustable backstays, constructed out of 316 stainless, each having a 6,000-pound working load and 11,000 pound braking load limit. After getting over the sticker shock on these new pieces of hardware, our only regret is that we didn't invest in these years earlier. For lighter weight tenders, using a more conventional and traditional wire cable setup with turnbuckles seems to do an adequate job, so long as they are routinely inspected for signs of wear, corrosion, loose connections, and they are properly tensioned. Most boats in our size range prefer to operate with limited crew. This makes launching or retrieving a large or heavy tender, say anything over 1,500 pounds, extremely challenging if you are using a single pick crane. As discussed more in Episode 5, when operating light on crew, the only safe way to manage a heavy tender in anything other than flat calm conditions is with a dual davit system. While discussing cranes and davits, it's critically important to periodically inspect all your pulleys, shivs, cargo lines, 
splices, swage fittings, and hydraulic hoses for chafe, wear, fatigue, and corrosion. When it comes to your hydraulic hose ends, using stainless steel fittings is the way to go in terms of longevity, reducing ongoing maintenance, and ultimately cost. Regardless of how good a job you do in preparing, priming, and epoxy coating steel hydraulic fittings, you will inevitably start to see signs of rust and corrosion within a few years. After repainting these fittings once or twice, you will have exceeded the cost of using 316 stainless steel fittings. Furthermore, hydraulic hoses left exposed to UV radiation will cause degradation and premature failure of the hoses. This will be an even more painful experience if you have invested in stainless steel hose fittings. If you are going to go to the expense and trouble of making up these new hoses with stainless fittings, which will be exposed to UV, then it is a smart investment to sheathe these hoses with ballistic nylon covers. When cruising in isolated and remote regions where there is no cellular network and where your VHF radio will be out of range of any other boats, you will need additional layers of safety to ensure that you are self-sufficient. This is especially the case if your tender experiences a mechanical breakdown while you're out exploring. This poses an unsafe and potentially life-threatening situation, especially in cold, isolated, and remote regions. Under the heading of plan for the worst and hope for the best, our fail-safe solution has been to detach our lightweight 9.9 .9 horsepower Yamaha outboard from our smaller inflatable tender and transport it with us on the large tender. Despite having never needed to actually use this backup engine, it gives us a viable plan B, peace of mind, and doesn't require any additional cost or add yet another piece of equipment which needs to be routinely run and maintained. Another often overlooked and underappreciated attribute of a long-range expedition yacht is a realistic assessment of what constitutes having adequate storage space. A crucial component for this class of boat is to have a well-designed storage plan that optimizes the utility of the available storage space. Items need to be stored so as to prevent damage or shifting during rough passages, while still providing well-organized, accessible, safe, and efficient utilization of storage space for essential items. Since some of you may either be thinking about transitioning to an expedition boat, or perhaps relatively new to the process, which admittedly can be a bit overwhelming. We thought it might be helpful to spend a moment and detail some of the many items typically found on an expedition yacht and the types of items which will end up inhabiting these storage spaces. In many cases, you will find dive equipment on board these boats, either for recreational purposes or more importantly, in the case a line gets wrapped around the prop, a stabilizer fin, or to inspect or clean the hull rudder, thrusters, transducers, or through hull fittings. This will require multiple tanks and regulators, plus gauges, masks, fins, snorkel, wetsuits with buoyancy compensators or a dry suit, weight belts, underwater lights, cutting tools, or other miscellaneous spare parts and supplies to accommodate the number of divers on board. A single dive tank, depending on what conditions you find yourself and how hard you are working, will provide about one hour of dive time. So you are either going to want to carry multiple tanks or alternatively, you may want to consider a compact dive compressor, which doesn't take up much more space than the equivalent of about two dive tanks and provides you with greater flexibility, autonomy, and convenience. We should note that these units will require a small amount of additional maintenance, spare parts, and filters. If you do carry dive tanks, then it's also a good idea to consider carrying a 75-foot hookah hose, which can be used when diving on your boat or with adapters to run a selection of air-driven power tools. When embarking on extended passages or cruising in remote areas, having additional freezer space can be highly beneficial. In addition to allowing for food preservation and extended storage, 
We typically pre-cook and freeze 175 pounds of Serena's meals, which can occupy 30% of our boat deck freezer. If you are traveling in warm climates, like anywhere along the southeastern part of the United States, the Caribbean, the Mediterranean, in Central America, or the South Pacific, then you will need a place to store spare paint, along with other temperature-sensitive ship stores. As just one example, we store all our touch-up paints, primers, accelerators, reducers, and solvents in the freezer for both longevity and for safety. Other than the deck space which they occupy and having to fabricate a locker, these 120-volt AC drop-in freezers cost less than one gallon of all-grip paint, and running 24-7, we have never had one fail. Since we mentioned storing paint, it is probably worth pointing out that you will also need to carry an inventory of painting supplies, like a sander, sandpaper, brushes, touch-up spray bottles, rollers, containers, trays, filters, a respirator, tarps, tape, and more. Depending on the size of your boat and if you have a high-pressure washdown system, you will also need about a 75-foot length of non-marking wire-reinforced high-pressure hose, plus a long and short spray gun nozzle. Each of your tenders will require storage space for their lifting harnesses, tie-down hardware, plus a few additional tie-down straps, just in case, a reserve fuel supply, unless your tender is diesel-powered, an air pump, canvas coverings and or a bimini top, perhaps a spare prop for one of your tender lines, and zincs for your tender. If you intend to go to the Mediterranean, then you will also need a passerelle, along with a lifting harness, removable handrails, and a trapeze to hold the shore side of the passerelle up off the dock. You are also going to need space for additional fenders, fender covers, and fender weights if you are using lightweight inflatable fenders. An aluminum folding telescoping ladder also comes in very handy when washing, polishing, painting, or for making repairs. If you carry bicycles, motorbikes, kayaks, a sailboard, paddleboard, jet ski, or fixed dock steps, these too will require secure storage, tie-down hardware, lifting harnesses, plus additional storage space for their spare parts, paddles, maintenance items, covers, etc. You are going to need a sizable area to store bulky items such as life jackets, additional abandoned ship supplies like a ditch bag or a large container of potable water and perhaps even a container with extra signaling devices. Other items you might end up carrying could be fishing poles, crab pots which require long lengths of line and large floats, a barbecue, and removable exterior window shades for your boat's windows when operating in warmer climates. In colder climates, you will want to consider some kind of T-top for your tender, along with roll-down side curtains and possibly even survival suits. Last but not least, my favorite tool, a wet-dry vacuum, is a non-negotiable item to have on board and is literally an indispensable tool. Ours is used multiple times per week, 52 weeks a year. They are useful for cleaning up spills, vacuuming up water or any non-flammable spill, inflating and deflating fenders, tidying up areas, or using as an air blower for cleaning and drying. You'll need to consider the trade-offs between size and capacity, and it's very helpful to have a retracting extension cord and drop light up on the boat deck to facilitate its use. So as if this wasn't already enough, now let's move down to the lower deck where you are going to want to have readily accessible storage space for daily operations. A well-ventilated, full-height drying locker for storing such items as foul weather gear, rain jackets and pants, a shopping cart, and perhaps a backstock of other supplies for exterior maintenance, lubrication, cleaning, and water filtration. In our case, our drying locker is located directly above the aft portion of our engine room. So we exhaust about 5% of our warm engine room air through this hanging locker to keep everything warm and dry. If possible, you will really appreciate a full-height, well-ventilated locker 
for hanging dock lines, service loops, storing dock stairs, a stair platform, possibly a telescoping ramp, dock power extension cords, a splitter box, a variety of power plugs and adapters, potable dock water hoses and hose fittings, fenders, fender holders, mats, chafe protection, and an assortment of smaller lines, and the list goes on. Smaller lockers on the back deck are useful for storing things like buckets, soap, vinegar for salt removal, all the other miscellaneous boat cleaning supplies, extension boat poles, assorted deck brushes, squeegees, chamois, rags, perhaps a retracting wash down hose reel, etc. All of this adds up to reinforce the notion that on an expedition boat, you can't have too much storage space. Separate and distinct from the storage lockers, you will also likely need to provide space for electric shore power retracting reels, along with about 200 feet of shore power cords, an inlet for dock water, the ability to do some water pre-filtration, including the possibility of a UV sterilizing light, water pressure gauges, along with a dock water pressure regulator and a bypass valve. A hot and cold water outlet is also useful if you are diving, swimming, coming back from the beach, washing your pet, or just using the hot water to ease the process of removing salt and soot from the transom. All that we have just described pertains to exterior deck storage. For context and perspective, this is just a fraction of the boat's overall storage and inventory requirements. Expedition boats require careful planning and consideration when it comes to understanding your storage space, assigning what goes where, and ongoing inventory management. When preparing your stores, spares, and parts inventory, you will need to include such items as frozen, refrigerated, and dry goods, engine and generator parts, spare pumps and associated rebuild parts, a variety of lubricants, filters, fuel lubricity additive, anodes, polishes, cleaners, degreasers, waxes, paper and cloth towels, detergents, solvents, adhesives, hardware, plumbing, fasteners, mechanical and electrical tools, and parts including an assortment of spare wire connectors, fuses, circuit breakers, heating and air conditioning and water maker filters, plus each of their spare part requirements. Batteries, bulbs, washer and dryer spare parts, spare hydraulic, plumbing and engine hoses, along with an emergency hydraulic hose with multiple adapters, manuals, charts, flags, reference books, safety equipment, medical supplies, pet supplies, and more. From an organization efficiency and space perspective, it's important to recognize that most all of this stuff will need to be sorted and collected into boxes, bags, or containers, which will themselves take up additional space. Then all of these items need to fit into existing storage spaces, be cataloged and accessible. Storage is a crucial aspect of the overall yacht's operation that can't be underestimated or overlooked. If you have pets on board, like we do, then you will also need a designated area where the pet can go to relieve themselves. A freshwater washdown hose, a pee mat, and a pet door which can be sealed and secured. For those interested, the best pet door we have found is the custom Max Seal Pro Door made by Security Boss, which has high quality dual flaps, like the ones used on commercial walk-in refrigerators, an internal security panel, special high wind magnets that actually work, and a rain guard. Another item which we have appreciated over the years was investing in a high quality commercial spray nozzle for our washdown hoses. They cost a lot more up front, but will last a lifetime, are indestructible, have all brass or stainless steel internal parts, a thick rubber replaceable boot to protect the surfaces around the boat are more effective and have far better ergonomics. We have been using the Strayman's M70 nozzle now for 25 years and have had no trouble with it. Just like on the upper decks, it's important on the lower decks to have good general side and aft deck illumination, 
for both safety and security. We divide our exterior walkway lighting into AC and DC emergency lighting, which has the added benefit of providing a low-tech visual confirmation when we are off the boat that both our AC and DC systems are functioning properly. Another indirect benefit of deck lighting is that this additional illumination will really assist in the ability of your security cameras to record far clearer images at night. So this leads into our next topic of external cameras. In recent years, CCTV cameras have come way down in price, are easy to install, and are very handy at monitoring the dock and pedestrian traffic when you're off the boat. They also permit you to monitor your fenders, dock power pedestal, shore power indicator lights, other passing boat traffic on the exposed side of the boat, and even how well the lines are adjusted by seeing your boat's movement relative to the dock. These exterior cameras provide an excellent psychological deterrent, especially if the cameras are readily identifiable by using a separate IR light, which is how we have ours set up. In addition to using these exterior cameras when we are off the boat, we also use interior cameras to monitor our Maritron system with an away page, which allows us to see at a glance our shore power, DC power, smoke detectors, bilge pumps, wind speeds, and the exterior, interior, and freezer temperatures. In addition to our low-cost camera setup, we also use a much higher quality and resolution pan-tilt zoom camera setup to monitor our engine room, aft and side decks, along with a 360-degree camera on the mast. We'll save this topic as part of a future video on vessel monitoring. A few additional tips while on the topic of exterior decks. When entering or departing a congested or crowded harbor, traveling in a narrow or restricted waterway like the Intercoastal Waterway, St. Lawrence Seaway, busy commercial harbors, etc., where every second counts, we typically will set our anchor out over the bow roller so it can be more quickly deployed in case of an engine or steering failure. Low flow deck drains are a nice feature to have in addition to scuppers and freeing ports so as not to stain or streak your painted or gel coat topsides with dirt and mineral deposits. If you have an air compressor or high pressure washdown system on board, it is useful to think about providing pressure gauges and outlets on the boat deck, the back deck, and in the case of the high pressure washdown on the foredeck. Finally, a few thoughts on washing, waxing, and caring for the exterior surfaces. I received a question this week on how best to approach removing salt while washing the boat. The short answer is that unless you are only interested in rinsing off the boat, that any salt accumulation needs to be fully removed before taking a brush or mitt to the boat. Salt when dry and in its crystalline form is anywhere between 60 and 400 grit which is very abrasive. It needs to be fully removed before washing the boat. There is no easy single step or spray on solution that we have found effective. Years ago, we tested the most popular brand of liquid salt remover and found that it did little more than vinegar. And unless this chemical was completely rinsed off and removed, it would stain the surface of our paint. The easiest and quickest way to remove salt if it is not too baked onto the surface, is by using the high pressure washdown hose, starting at the mast and working your way down to the water line. If that doesn't remove all the salt, then the fastest, least expensive, and most effective way we have found is by using a 50-50 mixture of distilled white vinegar and water in a large spray bottle. Depending on the sun and temperature of the hull, we work in one area at a time to dissolve the salt while then giving us the time to completely rinse off any trace of the residual vinegar and dissolved salt before it dries in that area. Although this process does add an additional step, it goes surprisingly quickly. I'm sorry to report that there really is no shortcut that we are aware of if you want to ensure that you don't end up abrading the exterior finishes on your boat. 
In the past 30 years, we haven't had any experience on how best to care for gel coat finishes. So best if we leave that discussion to others. Oasis is painted with Allcraft 2000 and Allgrip LP paints. We are big proponents of waxing and use Allcare, which is a protective polymer wax sealer. We apply this product by hand twice a year and have found it to be a superior product in terms of shine, protection, and preserving the longevity of our painted surfaces. Admittedly, it is costly, laborious, and time-consuming until you compare it to the cost, hassle, and time of repainting. When it comes to the washing of the boat, we use all-wash concentrate, which has a mixing ratio of one ounce per gallon. It contains no alkalis, acids, or abrasives. It rinses off better than other soaps we have used, so it minimizes the buildup of soap deposits, and it decreases the drying time. It also has the advantage that it is compatible with their formulation of all care, so it removes less of the sealer with each application than you would otherwise find using other boat washing products. That said, we use all wash sparingly and only when necessary to remove soot or pollution. Otherwise, we are usually good to go with just a high pressure rinse. Because our hull is a dark color, we rinse the boat with water containing less than 15 parts per million of dissolved solids so that for the most part the boat essentially dries spot free and we avoid the buildup of mineral deposits on the painted surfaces. We have also found it worthwhile to wax all of our windows along with our interior shower doors once a year with no streak gel gloss glass wax polish. This is probably a good time to mention that if you are ever thinking of painting or of repainting your boat. You never ever want to use any products on the exterior of your boat that contain even trace amounts of silicone. A good example of products to stay away from would be products like Rain-X or Armor All Glass treatments, as they both contain silicone emulsions. While on the subject of products to stay away from, we intentionally don't carry any abrasive products like Soft Scrub, Comet, or Ajax onboard Oasis, and we automatically dilute just about every degreaser or cleaner by adding 50% water. All of our exterior stainless is 316 low carbon, so unless we are in the Mediterranean or the Caribbean, we can typically get away with polishing our stainless once a year. After having experimented with just about every product imaginable, we settled on using Flitz Paste Polish for the past 20 years. It has provided the best shine, least residue or haze, contains no abrasives, is non-flammable, and leaves behind a durable protective wax finish. The trick with using Flitz is to use it sparingly. Although this product may at first appear expensive, when applied correctly, it actually represents a fair value. A soft toothbrush is best for getting any residual polish out from and around screw heads, Flitz also works great on aluminum, as our original 30-year-old diamond plate in the engine room will attest. While on the subject of screws, and depending on what product was used when these fasteners were originally bedded, this is an item which should be put on the long-term maintenance schedule about every 15 years. For most of you, this won't be an issue, but for those of you who have an older boat or intend to keep their boat for many years, it's a good idea to note rebedding all your exterior screws on the longer term maintenance list. If you wash your own boat, you'll have a pretty good idea when this step becomes necessary. Canvas cleaning and waterproofing is another ongoing maintenance item. It's best to carefully follow the manufacturer's instructions for whatever fabric you are using. We clean our canvas once a year using a very mild non-detergent soap and we re-waterproof every three to four years using 303 Fabric Guard. We also have leather trim on some of our canvas, which we treat twice each year to help preserve the leather and keep it from drying out. Over time, your dock lines will get embedded with salt, dirt, and pollution. Starting at about year two, or whenever the line first starts to feel a little stiff, we will use a three-step process for washing our dock lines. We start by soaking the lines in a solution of warm water and vinegar 
for 20 to 30 minutes, agitating the lines every couple of minutes. Since our lines are dark, we next wash them using Woolite Dark Laundry Detergent, using warm water and the gentle or delicate setting. We then give them a final warm water rinse using downy liquid fabric softener and let them line dry. They usually come out feeling soft, buttery, and like new. That said, dock lines do have a finite light, and by using our older suit of dock lines over the winter months, we can expect to get about 10 years of use out of our cruising dock lines. Finally, washing your boat yourself provides an opportunity to closely inspect and pay attention to every detail which can easily be overlooked. We remain mindful during every boat wash to identify signs of chafe, metal fatigue, inspecting our hydraulic hoses, fold down hardware, especially swage fittings and painted surfaces to catch any small issues before they escalate into more significant problems. Preventing or correcting problems in a timely manner is generally easier, quicker, and far less expensive than dealing with extensive and time-consuming repairs or replacements. Performing regular maintenance and keeping your boat in good condition directly contributes to the safety and reliability of your boat. It protects your investment, extends the life of your boat, and often avoids costly failures, breakdowns, and migraine headaches. Okay, well that's it for this episode of An Achievable Dream. Uh, we certainly hope that you have found this useful. As always, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to send us a comment. And if you want to be notified of our next video, please hit the subscribe button below. Thank you again for joining us, and I wish you all a good summer and safe travels. All the best.